Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick. We're back to talk with Alec Pulianis about part two, with part two of the discussion of the offense from that Titans game in London. Uh, this second part, uh, we'll start with some offensive line talk. Then we'll talk about individuals. We'll get into your questions from the mailbag. Talk about MVPs as we uh, as we go through this, and uh, you got an interesting set of, sh- of, of stuff still to go. If you want to go back to the first episode, and listen to that. I'd highly recommend that. We talked about Lamar. We talked about a lot of general offensive scheme things. Where the Ravens' offense needs to improve uh, as the rest of the season unfolds, where it might be unrealistic to expect additional improvement. Um, and uh, a whole lot of things I think are interesting in that. And Alec, uh, some great stuff talking with you. I thought so you had some great thoughts in terms of uh, the Ravens playing some small pot poker in this game. They definitely did. Um, definitely wanted to give themselves uh, or not not give the Titans any extra opportunities than necessary. Um, and they definitely leaned on their uh, all pro kicker and it worked out all right for them in this game. Yep. Yep. He, it's interesting. The extra point that he missed was his longest kick of the day. And, uh, and that was, a, that was a severe breakdown, wasn't it? On the, on the, on the, along the kick blocking line. I don't know if I'd had the same, same um, optimism about each of the field goals after seeing that. I mean, it just completely broke down. Yeah, it was a mess. I, I really don't know what happened there. Um, very, very unusual. All right, well, let's jump into the second half of this. We'll talk about offensive line first. And uh, let me get my notes out here for a second. All right. All right, here we go. We'll talk uh, about the offensive line in general. Had one sack um, that they were party to. And actually, it's really only a third of a sack. Uh, Zeitler and uh, and Moses uh, gave it up together. And it really was only a pressure. Lamar got pr- pressured out of the pocket, run to the right. Uh, honestly should have been a minus two in terms of the total score on the play. So that's exactly how I called it. I gave minus four of that effectively to Lamar who made the decision then to run and got sacked on the outside for a, for a loss of two, by the way, that's usually a great gamble when Lamar Jackson is deciding he wants to take yeah. a chance on running. So we don't uh, deny him that either. It's just not, not the offensive line's fault that, uh, that, that ended up being a sack. Yep. Uh, no other quarterback hits in this game. We mentioned this a little bit in the, in the first show was something really nice to see on this turf. Yeah, definitely a big win. Obviously, uh, Tannehill did get injured on it. Uh, heard it felt like concrete getting tackled on, which is like unacceptable. Like what, why, why are we playing? What? Why are million dollar athletes playing on this? Like, uh, anyways, <laughs> here's what I heard <laughs> while we were there. There is a grass field underneath that surface yes, yes. that they built. That's so they, they built this hard slash soft surface is either way too soft or way too hard. One of the two on top of a grass field, Just play on the damn grass field. They, yeah. it, they know how to repaint the pitch. I'm sure if they, you know, when they're going to go back to it for soccer and I know it, it's a football game, so it's probably going to mess up the pitch to a certain degree, but, but they've, they've got to be able to deal with that. I would think they, I, I assume in soccer, they have to replace grass on fields, even playing on it once per week, the way they slide around on that stuff. Sure. Feels like a solvable problem. <laughs> you know, it's, I think we have the technology. Yeah. All right. Anyway, the big problem with the Ravens here was 11 and a half pressures they allowed. Uh, there were two penetrations. There was one offensive holding we'll talk about a little bit later. And and so the scores suffered some from this game, despite the fact that they, uh, uh, you know, had a, a longer effort in terms of 69 scored snaps in this game. But let's go ahead and jump right into a talk about Ronnie Stanley to start with. Um, he has best game of the season. Uh, it's not nearly as good as I scored it as the PFF scoring for it, but it was still no doubt about it. If he played at this level, I think the Ravens honestly be pretty happy given what he's looked like so far this year coming into this game in particular. Uh, he did have, as I counted it, five pressures allowed in this game, but no other negative events. And that's four fulls plus two halves. Now let's do some explaining here. Cause if you look on PFF, you're going to see for Stanley and Zeitler in particular, that there are many fewer pressures than this that are scored by the PFF people. They have their own system of doing it. They use a system that is much more lenient to the offensive linemen in terms of charging pressures, although they still may have underlying downgrades for the play. I'm much more strict. I have a three-second protection rule as opposed to two and a half for PFF. And I also have a larger area which needs to be protected, meaning that the 
uh, offensive linemen can't allow the cone to be impeded, which allow the, the quarterback not to be confident stepping into his throws. So we have a difference in methodology will lead to a higher generally number of pressures as I count them than as PFF counts them. So I expect that, but there are just some really big differences in this game, uh, particularly for Stanley and Zeitler that, uh, that showed up and, and, and made a big difference in terms of the scoring. Um, I thought Stanley in this job did a really good job mirroring as he has. And this was more of a kind of a standard old school Lamar Stanley symbiosis game of he mirrors, he allows himself to be pushed back a little bit more than other left tackles do. Um, and and some of that's maybe due to the injury still, and some of it may be due to that's the way he wants to play it, to give Lamar an occasional bump pressure in the pocket, but also keep his hand keep hands off Lamar, which on this turf again, really important. Yeah, it is. Uh always been more of a finesse player, uh, with his mirroring, et cetera, than uh maybe like a you know, grinder. Um, and I will say though, um, you know, your statement, like if the, he plays this level the rest of the year, that the Ravens would be happy. That's, that's a depressing thought. Um, my, my follow-up question would be at that level, do they continue using him next year or do they consider the cap hit, uh, of cutting? I mean, it, it's a, it's a mountain of a question that the Ravens are going to have to, to have to scale this, this next two weeks and the rest of the off season. Cause they're basically, there are three ways they can replace Ronnie Stanley. The first is by trade, which will come at enormous cost. And the time to do it would probably be at the trade deadline this year, even though, you know, whoever has a left tackle to trade is basically giving up on their season is going to want a lot for it. OK, um, you could pick up a developmental guy that way. Maybe somebody some team is down on. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure why Dillard left the game here. He might have been hurt or they might have just been down on his play because he certainly didn't play well. But, you know, maybe a guy like that is somebody Tennessee would trade if you if you want to talk about uh, or or Petit Frere went over there. And he played. He played terribly. I don't really want him. But <laughs> but, but Dillard is an interesting player because he's been around a while. And, and I don't know if he'd, he'd be anybody they want to trade or not. Um but whatever, whoever they, they trade for, it's an enormous cost in terms of draft capital that they're going to have to give up, and maybe more so because if the guy's already signed for on a multi-year deal and they're basically getting out of more than just the rest of 2023, you're talking about the other team taking a big cap hit in terms of the prorated bonus that's left on the contract. And I, I just don't know if there's another team out there that's got the player they're willing to do that for for less than a first round draft pick. Yeah. Too high of a cost in my opinion, because uh, the tackle draft apparently is really good next year. So just keep your first and get one there. Hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully that's, that's what the Ravens do. I I think it's looking like it might be the Ravens biggest need. And sometimes it's a two year solution, you know, so you, you, if they keep Stanley next year, you know, basically, so it, they could, they forgo 8 million in cap savings to do it, but, but that may be the best solution to, to, ease your way into a good second year tackle in 2025. Yeah, I definitely think, I mean, to answer my own question, I think they do keep him at that level Mm -hmm. of play. Uh, A million is just not quite enough for what left tackles cost you in this league. And, um, you know, Moses could be uh, gone by then. So getting a tackle next year, having him play the right side um, and then maybe flipping to the left, if developmentally works out or, you know, we have options there. I think that's a, a totally reasonable approach. I, I think the chance of Moses getting extended is greater than the chance of Moses being gone. I'll say that right I, now. I, I would love that. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, Moses is going to play in Baltimore in 2024 unless something goes drastically wrong from what's going on right now. I think he's he's still far too good to uh, to give up the game. I, I mean, I guess he could retire or whatever for go some money, but I, I don't think he'll do that. I think there's too much left in the tank there, and he's he's probably got another contract left yeah. at this point. And so it's it'll be interesting to see how they they play that out. Um, getting back to Stanley here for a second, um, eight missed blocks, five losses at the line of scrimmage. That's kind of a lot for him, you know. In particular, for a left tackle with a right-handed running game. It is normal to have some missed blocks if you have a little bit of lack of mobility. Now, the old Stanley would go out to level three and he'd find somebody and he's knock him on his butt. But the but the the current Stanley just doesn't have that kind of mobility left. And so I expect some non-losses at the line of scrimmage missed blocks, but five losses at the line of scrimmage is a lot. And honestly, that was that was also not a good part 
of this game. There's still things he's doing very well. He had three highlights in the game, and one of them was a really nice play where he didn't really trust a stun handoff had been handled properly by Simpson, and he had his hands on both guys on that twist at the mm. same time, which is a really remarkable play. Yeah. You know, there's still there's still flashes of old Stanley, and um, I, I'm optimistic that he can play well. You know, there he obviously had that injury at the beginning of the year, but I thought he played pretty well down the stretch last year. I hope that he's able to get healthy again um, and, and get back to that level. I think it's reasonable. So that's my that's my hope. And, you know, he had very little, uh, you know, reps during the, the the season. So it could be a combination of, or, you know, the um, training camp. So it could be a combination of getting more reps, more cohesion and uh, getting healthier. Yep. 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 Uh, would would agree, and there's still a chance. I, I I think there's still a chance he can improve. We saw definitely big improvement from the Steelers game to this game. Uh, yeah. Highsmith was way too much for him. I, I I just, you know, a lot of this was Arden Key on that side in this game. Uh, he's not the, the 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 you know the top end of pass rushers. I thought Stanley did some good things against him uh, in general with the mirroring, but uh, uh, it just wasn't the it just wasn't the top of his game. Four blocks in level two, three three points on four pulls. So they're still using him for pulls. By the way, is is a is a good sign. Um, he got backed up on at least one pull where he impeded other people pulling from the other side, which was which was unfortunate. Uh, he did have one pancake in the game, and I mentioned three highlights earlier. Um, Again, a, a C for this game. Uh, PFF's got him scored higher. I just didn't see it the same way in, in terms of how I scored it. Uh, I, I'm going to talk to them about both Stanley and Zeitler from this game just to understand exactly where what our differences are based on. But it may just be definitional. It usually is. And uh, and they're, they're just seeing it a little bit differently and more leniently than I am. That's interesting too, because I feel like his run blocking was almost worse than his pass blocking. They weigh that higher, so uh, it's it's almost like you expected them maybe like equal out a little bit. Uh, I, I would I weighted higher too. I mean, you know, pass pass blocking at any position, I weighed higher than what PFF does. And mm-hmm. on the interior line, it's really extreme because I think PFF is something like eighty five fifteen at center, and and it's it's seventy thirty or something in between at guard and at tackle. It's fifty fifty and. Um, pass block is just way more important at every offensive oh, yeah. position. <laughs> no, I, I absolutely agree with you. And uh, I was saying like, I, but don't they make it more 50, 50 with run blocking. So I felt like since his run blocking was like poorer than his pass blocking, in my opinion, maybe that would help bring the scores a little bit closer than they were. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, but nope, <laughs> not, not that, not this time. It's, it's just, it's yeah. not, not the way I scored it. It's I I'm, you know, I'm open to being told by someone that that's not a pressure. I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to hand out the timestamps on this, but uh, uh, you know, the, the, the way I define it is, is kind of tight and, and Stanley gives up some pressures, uh, you know, with the, with the way he plays and, and uh, slow death while mirroring kind of uh, uh, yeah, method approach. he uses. Yep. Well, let's move on to John Simpson since we're uh, uh, seem to be kind of stalled here, but um, avoided penalties in this game, which has been nice. He's had a lot of problems with penalties again this year uh, going into this game. He'd had one penalty every 48 snaps of the Ravens after one, every 91 with the Raiders. And if you remember that one, every 91 was the real sticking point that made him not a good lineman um, mm-hmm. with them. And, and we thought maybe he'd corrected that by having zero in a very small sample size during preseason, such was not the case once the game started for real and uh, and he started accumulating holding calls again. Um, so it's nice to see him uh, get through without a penalty, but he still had 10 missed blocks in this game. That held the score back a lot. He allowed three pressures. Um, the, the Titans seemed to figure out that play, twists and stunts on that left side were a good thing. They also figured out that fanning out Stanley was a good thing because Simpson was fairly slow on help blocks on that side. So important thing for a left guard to do is process from inside out where he, he first of all starts usually with his right hand on the center's man. If the center, if there's a guard bubble on that side and decides what he needs to do in terms of, of making that block. And then he's got a process into level two, well, for, for, he's got a process for twists. He's got a process for, for, for anybody coming from level two that he needs to pick up. And then his next thing is, is the help block on the tackle. And you've got to go through that sequence of events, the, the sequence of, of blocking opportunities pretty quickly to make that help block useful at all. 
The guy we saw do exceptionally well, which is no surprise because he did everything exceptionally well as an offensive line, was Marshall <laughs> Yanda helping out James yeah. Hurst for the first half of 2018 before Orlando Brown was magically given the job seven weeks later or eight weeks later than he should have had it. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, James Hurst, anyway, got got held up for a lot of that first uh, – uh, propped up a lot by Yanda's play in that first half of that season. Yeah, the Simpson play has been uh, not as high as I was hoping for going into this season. Um, left side of the line in general has been the bigger pain point, I feel like. Yep. Uh, even though Zeitler's also had some troubles. Um, this this is uh, the most disappointing part of the Ravens so far this year, uh, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, next up would be probably, probably the wide receivers, <laughs> you know, uh, mm-hmm. would be the next biggest disappointment. Um, but yeah, the the line needs to get better. They need to find a way. And unfortunately, at the trade deadline, it's very difficult to find linemen. They're extraordinarily expensive, even uh, interior linemen. And yeah, I mean... I don't know how long the leash Simpson has over Cleveland at this point, um, but it's it's getting a little. I don't know. I'm not dire, but like I almost want to see a rotation at this point and see what Cleveland can do. Um, and yeah, it's 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 going to be interesting going forward. We might be getting closer to that. There w- that will be a big continuity issue. But one of the things that Simpson's been really good at in college was processing center to center to in his case, center to right, because he's a right guard in college, but, you know, center to the outside. And it would be interesting to see if he would bring a little bit better in terms of help blocking for Stanley, because they're wasting a lot of eligible receivers trying to chip on that side. And if you have a guard who, who can, who can react quickly to what's going on there, then you get, you get, you get a better chance there to, uh, to keep your receivers in play. So that would be nice. And uh, we'll see that. I I don't, I, you know, I, I don't think it's impossible that we'll see Cleveland this year at left guard. I think that that the Simpson is working on a shorter leash as time goes by uh, on what's going on. Three uh, three pressures in this game for Simpson, three of six on pulls. Um, the balance issues have continued, but they're probably not quite as bad in this game. He was not pancaked in this one in particular. Uh, not that I not that I noticed anyway. He just has some additional balance issues where sometimes he's jacked up or he, he doesn't really seem to be playing at the right pad level. Um, and, uh, and, and that causes him problems, but, uh, he missed 10 blocks. Four of those were losses at the line of scrimmage. And he has others where he's, he's getting lost on a pole, not making a block in level two, et cetera, et cetera, only made two blocks in level two. So when you miss 10 blocks, four losses at the line of scrimmage, you know, the six miss blo- the six other missed blocks are going to be some combination of missing on poles, missing in, in level two, um, those kind of things. And so he didn't have a good rate of blocks in level two in this game is, is my point. He did have yeah. two pancakes. I didn't have him with a single highlight C minus for the game, just scratched in at the bottom level. Uh, some of that is, is the quality of the Titans interior defenders. So I did give him a reasonable um, adjustment for that in the game. Now, when he went three for six on pools, um, does that mean he missed on those three or, did he, or does that possibly include not having work? I forget how um, so so he was never the trailer on a pole. So okay. he, he you pick up a courtesy point potentially if you're the trailer, and there was only one courtesy point awarded in this game. It was to Moses. Um, okay. but everybody else got their got their points legitimately. So he was he was always the lead player on poles and he uh, missed missed three out of six times. So it wasn't yeah. that he, he didn't have any negative plays, he didn't have like a P minus two, which sometimes shows up for a player. But okay. uh, but he had uh, he had three zeros and three ones. Okay. All right. Um, move on. Talk about Tyler Linderbaum. Absolutely. The, uh, the highlight. Yeah, he was, he was the highlight of the offensive line. Best game of the season for him. And honestly, he's been one of the really positive surprises now since he's come back from injury. I think he's played um, improved football every week. And this, this being his best game, had no negative events. Lamar did run him out of one pressure. Uh, so PFF has him scored for pressure. I haven't scored for none. And that was the reason is the difference is that one pressure. So it's nice to know, you know, definitionally, at least mm-hmm. how we're getting a difference. Um, he had six missed blocks Four of those were at the line of scrimmage. So it's not like he's not having some trouble anchoring still, but they didn't turn into pressures, which is a, which is a positive thing. Nine, nine level two blocks. That's Linderbaum being the guy you hope. And given he's coming back from the knee injury, high ankle sprain, um, you know, it's, it's nice to see him, getting out there and making some plays as a run blocker, three out of three on poles, two pancakes, four highlight combination blocks. So um, really like to see Linderbaum coming through for the run game 
in the way he did there. And honestly, had a pretty damn good pass blocking game as well, which is which is probably even the it's definitely the more important thing to see. But but in a lot of ways, it's the more important thing to see for Linderbaum because it's it's the weakness um, that he had last year. And so, uh, yeah, I think we've seen great growth from Linderbaum. And I think this was kind of, you know, in a lot of ways, what I'm expecting. I just want people to be reasonable about where he was entering the year. But he's grown as a pass blocker this year, and it's it's nice to see. And he's a player, I'm, I'm actually, despite the fact he had an A in this game, and, and I think, you know, I, I hope for the rest of the season, his overall level of play improves even from where he has been on average so far this year. And I think there's there's reasonable prospect that will occur. I agree. I uh, definitely have been seeing his game improve throughout the season. And I thought this would be a difficult test for him. I thought this was going to be a tough line. And it seemed to be that way for the rest of the uh, offensive line. But he really excelled and, and rose above. So really great to see that. And um, he'll need to continue it next week. <laughs> with yeah. uh, I could I could definitely see him having to pick up some stunts and... Um, and having blitzing uh, linebackers, so they'll have to be um, will have to be on his A game. Yeah, very very much. And uh, you know, it's a the, the the front four the Lions present normally are a difficult group, and and then they do they do come at you from linebacker a fair amount. So it'll be an interesting uh, an interesting test for him. And and you know, Linderbaum is now you know didn't know whether Simpson or Linderbaum would be the problem for the left a gap, but thought that the left a gap was going to be the biggest risk for the, for the Ravens. And um, I think it's probably still there. I think he's, he, you know, he's, he's going to have to do more Mm -hmm. to make up for having, you know, Simpson there than the other way around at this point. So uh, we're asking Simpson to pick up Stanley. We're asking Linderbaum to pick up Simpson, (laughs) I guess is what I'm saying. Well, and the one thing I I would say is we talked last year about how the line was set up to kind of protect Linderbaum you know, you had Powers and you had Zeitler playing at a yes. high level. And now it, it's kind of flipping where we're like, all right, Linderbaum, <laughs> help out Simpson. Uh, how about Zeitler who's been struggling? Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, great, great point. So let's talk about Zeitler while we're there. Uh, took a step back in this game kind of in more ways than one. There were several steps back he took in, in his uh, you know, ability to anchor in this game, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one penetration, I have him for three and a half pressures, a sixth of a sack that he shared with Moses. Uh, it's interesting. You're going to go out there for PFF and you're going to see zero pressures. And, you know, it's just something I have to talk to them about, understand definitionally, you know, how they got to the same point. But uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk through that. They're always very good about about going through play by play. Four missed blocks in this game. Only one of those is a loss of the line of scrimmage. That's good to see. At least you want to have that number. The losses at the line of scrimmage um, be low. Uh, typically what a loss of the line of scrimmage is, is the ball is out quickly often on a pass play or he may have been getting backed up or jacked up on a run play away from the ball and so it doesn't end up being a negative score it just ends up being a zero but it's a it's still a point you know potentially lost on that play but it's nice to see that number in particular minimized much less costly the team if he um, pulls and he doesn't find work as the lead or he goes to level two and he can't find a block those are those are frankly much less costly missed blocks yeah hopefully he's able to uh, establish better anchor going forward because the rest of the um I guess the rest of the peripherals are not as bad. Uh, you could see kind of a, a, a way to get better there, but I would, I definitely have to say Zeitler's, um, you know, loss of step this year has been the biggest surprise. Um, you knew, we always knew it was a possibility um, getting up there in age, but this was a, a little bit of a shock to the system considering how well he played last year versus now. Yeah. Five out of seven on poles, four blocks in level two, two pancakes, two highlights. It's a really nice combination of, of, of um mobility yeah impact in this game so it's not like he's lost everything you know there's 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 a, there's a good lineman here that understands how to play offensive line he's just having a little bit of trouble anchoring as a pass blocker and and hopefully that uh, uh that gets better uh, a high d after adjustment for zeitler so i wish i saw it the same way pff did and i wish i really believed in it the, the way the, the way they did but uh, uh that's how i have it scored anyway I wonder if he's dealing with an injury at all. I can't recall if he, I thought he was out of camp for a brief bit and maybe this is lingering in a way that we don't know about, but um, yeah, it's just, it's uncharacteristic. You know, I don't remember that during the early part of camp where the reporters are welcome for the entire practice and whatnot. Um, the, 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 The thing I remember saying basically all the way to the end of the preseason is 
the thing that has benefited the Ravens most that puts the Ravens in the best shape is that their their entire offensive line is remarkably healthy right now. And yet mm-hmm. we, we, we then saw enough in the preseason that Salah wasn't really ready to play and, and Falele was you know still a developmental player as well. And not putting them down or anything, they're just, they're just not ready right now. Uh, you know, there are a couple of developmental players who you hope come around at some point. Um, but in terms of health, Man, they're in great shape. They had Mustafer. Simpson was looking great during the preseason. Yeah. You know, they they kept the the big six, including McCary, in in bubble wrap for the entire time. Uh, the only yep. thing that was a little bit concerning was that Stanley hadn't played any any actual competitive football going into week one. <laughs> he hadn't played in, in, in right. any pads yet. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's jump ahead and, and go to Moses. Uh, solid game, played the whole thing, which is really nice. Um, one penetration allowed, one sixth of a sack. That's the one he shared with Zeitler. Uh, had an offensive holding call. That's unfortunate, and that, that kind of hurt his score a little bit. But honestly, a, a very good game overall. Uh, six missed blocks, three of them losses at the line of scrimmage. One level two block, three pancakes, four to four on poles. Did have one freebie as a trailer on this one. So he ran his line. He was able to get through without you know impeding traffic or impeding the running back. But uh, but he actually got out into level two and and still could not find a block. So that's uh, that is what it is. He's still got a point on that. Um, the Ravens really need all three of their tackles healthy. And when I say three, I'm including McCary in that group. I'm not including yeah. Fala Lele. Um, and, and, and honestly, I'm not even sure that's enough. And that's why I still think offensive tackle is a place they've got to go at the um, trade deadline. And, and and really figure if you if you, you can either make a big play for your guy for next year or you can make a, a, a little play for a guy who's a, a legitimate swing tackle who's maybe got some experience playing left tackle. So if there was a Jawan James out there on somebody's roster, uh, you know that 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 might be a guy who might be able to step in at left tackle. That guy maybe is worth a gamble at, at, at yeah. this time of year. Well, and it also opens you up to use McCarry at left guard, um, which we know is a. Uh, possibility going into the year if nobody sees the job that was going to be his job and uh luckily simpson played at a high enough level i guess that they felt comfortable to go that way and we can keep him as that uh utility man particularly for the tackles but um yeah an added, an added tackle could allow you to use mccarry in other ways on this offensive line I, I, one of the things that they might be thinking for Cleveland is we want him available at right tackle and we have McCary yeah. at left tackle and they might have four guys then, but um, you, you're short, you're kind of short an interior lineman if that's true. And and we know now that Salah is not that guy. Mustafer maybe could be that guy, but it, it seems like he's Aaron Rodgers season is officially over, but yours has just begun at my bookie NFL college ball and the brand new cash out system gives you options to bet and win all season long. First two legs of your parlay hit, cash out early and place another bet or let it ride for a chance at a bigger payday. Join us at MyBookie for an entire season filled with daily odd boosts, same game parlays, and huge prize pool contests. Right now, MyBookie has a no strings attached cash bonus that lets you deposit and withdraw quick. Use the promo code RAVENS on your first deposit of $50 or more and you can receive up to $200 in cash instantly credited to your MyBookie account. That's promo code RAVENS to claim your cash bonus now. You can bet anything, anytime, anywhere, only with MyBookie. With the busy fall season already in swing, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. Guys, I've shared moving. I was using this for all my meals. Now I'm working from home. Guess what? Microwaves in the other room, I'm using this for all my meals. Factor is how I get through my lunch day every day. But they've got breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I haven't tried the breakfast ones yet, but why not? I think I might add that to my next order. But I love them for lunch. Plus, they've got new autumn fall flavors out right now for a limited time featuring seasonal veggies like cranberry, pecan chicken, and apple Dijon pork chops. And again, Just like everything else, they're ready in just two minutes. They'll satisfy your fall cravings during this busy season without the hassle. So go ahead and level up with Gourmet Plus options as well. Prepared to perfection by chefs and ready to eat in record time. Treat yourself to upscale meals with premium ingredients like broccoli, leeks, 
truffle butter, and asparagus. Head to factormeals.com slash ravens50 and use the code ravens50 to get 50% off. That's code ravens50 at factormeals.com slash ravens50 to get 50% off your factor meal today. The right size to play center and has played pretty well there. Um, and you know you, that's the one place where you got a better offensive lineman. You're not you're not thinking about replacing it all in Linderbaum. So uh, anyway, it's, it's yeah. a, obviously a tough set of choices they have to make. Yeah, but Moses' first game back from the injury, I thought played pretty darn well, uh, all things considered. Uh, indeed, like you know, had to play with Simpson as well. And uh, yeah, I definitely was happy to see him back. And I I, I had concerns because if I recall, it was a shoulder injury. Very important for a tackle to have a good shoulder. <laughs> yep. And uh, yeah, I was, I was worried that would really degrade his play, but looked like he was ready to play. E for Moses after adjustment. Uh, he got a fair amount of Simmons in this game. I thought he did a pretty good job against him. Uh, it's not like he he was perfect or anything, but he, he did some good 12 to 6 blocking uh, to get people by the pocket. And he uh, had a little bit of help too from his friends in terms of eligible receivers and uh, honestly, I don't think we could have expected better from Moses returning from uh, from the injury. Mm-hmm. I, I we'll we'll talk about some individual. Cleveland came in for one snap, made his block. Uh, that's all we need to say about that. I want to get into some other position players and let you go first. As always, I do want to remind you as we're kind of going through this. I don't have MVPs on our list of things to talk about. Maybe you think about your three, two, one as we're kind of exchanging comments on uh, on yeah. some of the skill position players. But who's who's your guy? Who do you want to talk about first? Uh, I'll go with Aguilar first. Uh, obviously had that nice play on third down, almost was able to break it. And uh, he's been, I feel like, the most aware receiver. It feels like he really understands the playbook, has a good chemistry with Lamar, and uh, has been a real big surprise and useful to the team. Only two catches on the day, uh, but both of them for quite a bit of yards. His long was 21 yards, total of 40. So the other one had to be 19, right? So um, mm-hmm. heads up plays. Um, wouldn't be surprised to see more of him. Like I said, he just feels so competent. Um, I feel like he's a, a better option right now than Beckham and Bateman at the moment. I hope that switches. I hope it flips. But at the moment, it feel, he feels like the better wide receiver and a really great return so far. Yeah, it's it's been a good return. I mean, they did trade a six round draft pick in terms of a compensatory pick to get him. Yeah. So yep. it's not just that he is a one year void year guys. They paid I, I think it was three and a quarter million. There may be some incentives that go with that. Um, I'm not mm-hmm. totally plugged into that, but the the problem I have with Aguilar in this game um, wasn't anything about the statistics. It's it's well maybe it is something about statistics. It's that 29 of his 40 yards came after the catch. So you got almost 75% of his yards after the catch. So still not making downfield plays. That said, I love the fact that he went 5 plus 15 for that 20-yard gain early on or 21 or 19 or whatever it was that, that was the, the, the big early play. Um, that, was a, that was a very nice run after the catch. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to talk about something that we talked about in the first episode, but I think maybe deserves a little bit more discussion is the, is the complete absence of likely Duvernay and Kolar from the offense. I think we can lump them in. You could maybe even throw Mitchell in here if you want to, but four yeah, guys that, yeah. that just, just are not part of the offense. And um, I, I want the ball distributed more than it's getting. Obviously we're, we're, we're running the, the, the season is, is progressing. It was one where we hoped you know, we get more scheme targets. You mentioned earlier the scheme targets to Bateman early in the game I thought were mm-hmm. good, but they weren't real trust-building targets. Likely Duvernay, Kolar, and now now Mitchell, I think maybe just a health thing that they're going to try and get him into the game, but likely Duver- Duvernay and Kolar. Um, likely he's not getting targets. I uh, did have a drop, but he's caught these other three balls of the season and, and, he's, and for good total results in terms of 32 yards. Duvernay is, is having an incredibly tough year in terms of getting good open targets, but that shouldn't preclude his usage on gadget plays. So if you're using him purely as a receiver and that's not working, we'll get him back involved in the offense some other way. Get him in the backfield, you know, jet motion. Do, have him do some of the things that Flowers shouldn't be doing every single time in terms of, of being a, uh, a, you know, a motion guy. Um, and then I just think the, the, the tight ends, honestly, in this offense, you know, we got a – 
we were told that there was going to be more tight end usage because Monken had been a big tight end guy at Georgia playing with the two guys <laughs> right. there last year. That has not come to fruition at all. I mean, we just, we've seen very little tight end usage. In fact, the total snaps by, okay, let's go to the total snaps by tight end because Andrews didn't play every single snap. So Andrews played 60 of the 71 snaps and the other two tight ends combined played 23. So they only played 12 more total tight end snaps than total snaps on the field. Think about yeah. that. Yep. That's not very much. And, uh, you know, they're just, they, they're not a very frequent 12 personnel team is what this has come down to. And, and it might be something they want to dip more into at least against some teams. Now, if it were case, it was just this team, that would be one thing, but likely hasn't had a target in three weeks. Kohler hasn't, you know, had some drop problems early in the season. Both, both those guys have, both those guys understandably lost some trust points early in the year with drops. But on the other hand, you know, they're part of the Ravens' young talent. They're second-year players. The Ravens have to figure out what they have there. Yeah, and I will say it could have been a byproduct of the game plan. So if you look at that um, heat map of where Lamar threw the ball, he legitimately did not throw a single ball between the hashes. They all were outside the hashes. They were attacking those corners um, that were um, weak. Yeah, weak. So it could have been a game plan thing. Uh, those are a lot of those players you describe are sometimes more between the hash players, but um, definitely something to keep an eye out for going forward. Um, the lack of usage is really interesting <laughs> um, when because that's a that's a significant chunk of players too that just aren't getting that many snaps in general. You know. Uh, Special team snaps, there's a little bit there, but those aren't even like core special teamers outside of Duvernay. So um, I guess uh, Mitchell is, but uh, yeah, I definitely uh, I definitely would like to see <laughs> a, a change there. Yeah, I, I, I want to look at this thing. I'm having trouble bringing it up here quickly enough, but uh, but I wanted to look at Lamar's uh, passing charts for uh for this season anyway I'll, i guess i'll do that in a moment but uh but that's a it's a very interesting point you're making because the titans definitely strong at linebacker strong at safety very weak at corner yeah um but then you you know you should be taking advantage of that in other ways too throwing to the outside but not necessarily short routes uh to your corner fulton very weak having a terrible year by the way um yeah. on one side and he was one of the guys I identified the new year foe show as somebody that the, the ravens could really go after so um i i was personally thinking bateman this would be his week to go off having an opportunity against fulton on that left side <laughs> at you know versus the right corner and that's unfortunate yeah you and me both um i guess the next thing i'll talk about is flowers you know had eight targets six catches 50 yards and a touchdown if you look at him and edward or um, not edward sorry uh him and andrews that's 50% of the target share right there. You know, fancy football may love it, but I think that's something we discussed that we don't love. And we want to see the ball distribute a little bit more. Um, and uh, liked what he did with his targets. Obviously, we wish for a, a couple more downfield targets, but um, I honestly wanted to see him honestly involved a little bit more. Um, felt like the successful drives had flowers in them and the unsuccessful drives did not. Uh, and... Yeah. So as much as I, you know, want to see it distributed more, I also like was hoping to see him get the ball more. So it's a always a, <laughs> a push and pull. I did not look at Flowers A dot in this game, but it was it couldn't have been high because he's got uh, you know, six yards and change, six and a quarter yards per target. That's mm -hmm. not acceptable. Look, Flowers has got to get down the field. He's got to be more of a threat to to distract the safety, to take the lid off, to to create space underneath. And I know the Ravens are having all sorts of problems, you know, having just generating time for plays to develop. But this is something where it's, it's, they have got to find a way to, to make more meaningful usage of flowers down the field. And, uh, you know, you, you look at this and, and in, in a most offensive line rankings by centralized group, most of them, honestly, I, I don't know if I completely trust them, but PFF, I do trust in terms of relative offensive line play because they've got their method for scoring. I know it's different from mine, but but it's it's going to be one where, at least from a relative standpoint, I think I agree with, with how they're ranking offensive lines, and in particular when they're separating run and pass blocking. So when they, when they do that thing, and the Ravens come out as one of the better offensive lines in the entire National Football League, you know, ninth or something among offensive lines, I'm thinking – 
really after this start, you know, how, how can you be there? If, if you're basically saying that, okay, it's going to be Stanley and Moses the rest of the year. And we're going to, we're going to, we're going to look at Stanley and say, he's going to be the average who he was from 2020 to or 2019 to 2022. Then I maybe agree with it. <laughs> but, but if yeah. you really look at how these guys are playing this year, it's, it's hard to believe the level of offensive line play has dropped that much across the league. <laughs> Doing a quick uh, math here. All right, there you go. So average depth of target in this game has been was 7.5 across all players. Lamar Jackson only had 227 air yards on his 30 attempts and uh, ranked quite low. There's only uh, five, six. Um, that's not the you know, C-A-Y, C-A-Y, that's the A dot, right? What's that? The C-A-Y uh, or the A dot? The, the completed air yards or the, a, uh, the average depth of target? So the completed air yards probably lower than that, right? Not seven point five. Oh no, yeah, they're not complete. These aren't complete. This is just total air yards. I okay. was doing it in front. Yeah. All right. So yeah, the, the if if we look at the let me look at completed air yards here because that'll just take a second. And this is for the entire season. We just want to look at week six, right? Yeah. So in, in terms of completed air yards, yeah, he's still where is he? Ooh, where is he? There he is. He's in the middle of the pack of four and a half uh, completed air yards. So that's not good. That's 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 actually kind of low. Probably about maybe twenty second out of thirty two or something. Uh, yeah. Seven and a half is his is his uh, a dot as you as you mentioned. By the way, that's a big difference it, to be three yards lower in completed air yards than your than your uh, intended air yards. So uh, yeah. you know, kind of a bummer there. But anyway, it's. Uh, you know, they, they do have to throw the ball. You, you mentioned earlier, whether it's in the first show or not, that, that they just haven't taken too many shots this year. No, they have not. They have not taken too many shots. They're definitely taking what the defense gives them, which is good. But uh, even when they have the opportunity to go deep, they're not taking it. So um, definitely challenging. Let's talk about Odell Beckham for a minute. And, and he had his moments in this game and, and also had his not moments in this game, but not really nice pass play, good yards after the catch, which is very positive, obviously. And, and uh, uh, he did a pretty good job, I think, in terms of finding space, even when Lamar did not throw him the ball. So there was certainly some of that, that, that he was open. A lot of those times he was on the left side. Lamar seems to be doing more processing on the right side uh, early in plays. But but when he did find him, obviously it was it was – it was to the left of center. I don't remember. It was in the in the in the two groove or the or the three groove that he actually caught the ball. But uh, but it was one where he, he he moved from left to center more than more than in any other direction. Um, here are the things on the two penalties that I'll point to. So the one penalty, the, the offensive pass interference on the two point conversion is very costly. It cost the Ravens. Um, well, it really cost the Ravens two points because they would have had the conversion there. Um, he engaged in the block early. That was unfortunate. It's also kind of a ticky tack, a little bit of an early call. So I understand that, but it did create a, a very difficult one point conversion then that did not get converted. That's not all his fault. So maybe it's unfair to, to give him the whole two points on that. Uh, it's still probably less than his impact on some other plays as he goes on, but then he he's been a complete, he is like, um, I don't know, what's the appropriate thing? Doctor Evil. What's it? The Super Friends. Who are the Who are the opposing characters to the Super Friends? The the evil oh, people. I don't know. <laughs> oh, Legion, Legion of Doom. Legion of Doom. Oh, okay. he's, he's been like a member of the Legion of Doom this entire year in terms of of picking up penalties. He knew exactly what he's doing because he goes over and he steps on Simmons' hand while he's down, <laughs> and Simmons got up and punched him in the chest, knocked him down, fifteen yard flag. Yeah, so, but not only did he have it timed up, so he stepped on his hand to, to to do it at the right time, but he also knew the hit was coming, so he knew exactly how to flop from it. Didn't even have to like reactively flop. He was prepared to go down as Simmons hit him when he's going up. He's basically you know halfway tipped over probably as he's going down or so on his on his standing up on his on his back heel ready to <laughs> ready to fall down. And, and Simmons and he apparently had to be separated after the game. I didn't see yeah. this. We were out of there pretty quickly, but it, what, what did you pick up? Yeah, I heard, I heard that happen too. I think it actually happened in, in the, uh, in the tunnel, I think, or like, you know, in the, in the facility, not at on the field anymore. So yeah, really, really interesting. Um, savvy, the guy, savvy veteran player uh, knows, knows how to draw some penalties and also how to, uh, you know, instigate maybe a little bit. Talk some trash, um, but uh, 
I'm trying to think if the Ravens have ever had such a player before, like a player who who literally was an instigator of penalties of this ilk. I don't mean a guy who knows how to flop. I mean, I saw Quadri- Quadri Ishmael take a great flop in the AFC Championship game uh, against the Raiders in 2000. But uh, I, I'm trying to think of any player that they've ever had who like exactly knew how to get a penalty whenever he, he basically needed to pull one off. It'd be like it'd be like an Anquan Bolden or somebody, but he he wasn't that sort of guy. Uh, yeah. not not like unsportman like penalties. That's that's like master class. Uh, I would say Torrey Smith got a lot of those. Uh, yeah, defense pass interference, but yeah. Yeah, that's a good yeah. one. It, it, he he got him by beating his opponents because he was just too fast for them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and so that that you know I understand, but I'm trying. I'm just trying to think of any other player, and you know the things he's pulled this year, the pulling the defensive back down on top of him with with the with the hand disguise. I mean, you, that's that's next level stuff. It's, you know, it's really it's it's valuable. He needs to deserve. He, he deserves to get credit for what he's doing, and yet I hope he doesn't get the the Ravens into some sort of general retaliatory situation where yeah. somebody else takes a hit for what he did. Yep. All right. Uh, uh, your turn. Is it, is it my turn? Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess let's go to Andrews. You know, the other guy in the target share, he had a couple super clutch plays, um, longer plays, 32 yard one comes to mind, uh, or 38 rather 38 yards. And, um, I just thought he played quite well in this matchup and yeah, just a, a gritty performance from Andrews and saw the connection with Lamar as always getting him, bailing him out in some key, key spots. It's one of the few guys that he'll go to down the field, even when covered that trust is, yeah. is clearly there. He, mm-hmm. he earned it in the end zone with it, with that great catch a couple of weeks ago in this game, he had one where he, where, you know, it was a potentially interceptable ball that he made sure that didn't happen. Uh, he took a big hit on that play, by the way. Nice two-way hit. Uh, not quite as bad as what you know Hamilton and uh, Stevens did to Chris Moore, but it was pretty bad in terms of of uh, taking hit. He wanted a flag on the play. He thought it was there early as well. But uh, but anyway, uh, played well and really nice to see his yards per target over ten for a game every once in a while. He's he tends to pick up a lot of small ones, and, and a lot of that's his own yak. Uh, making sure mm-hmm. he makes some some uh, yards after the catch on these, and he's been playing well. I, I don't have anybody else that we really need to hit on in this game. Obviously, you know what Hill did, what Edlers did. I think we hit on earlier. Uh, Ricard playing a little bit of a smaller portion of snaps, but uh, I think he's still very important to the team in terms of what he brings them. And I, maybe maybe we maybe we try and ask this question to each other: Is you've got a I think a four million dollar number coming up on Ricard next year? Do you say goodbye to him for that, given what you've seen of him with Monken in the offense still? Uh, probably. I guess it comes down to the development of Kolar and likely he's more of a tight end to me at this point in this offense. And uh, I guess the other question you have to think to yourself is, if you cut him for $4 million, who's signing him for any more? <laughs> Can you get him back for less? Um I, I, I wouldn't be shocked if you cut him and he's not, not too many teams are knocking down the door for him and his services. He might be able to get him back for cheaper. So definitely something to consider going forward. I mean, that's just something they can go to him directly and say, Hey, would you like to play for us for 3 million this year instead of 4 million? Uh, yeah. they, they can, they can have that conversation, you know, during the off season and, and, uh, and, you know, give him time even to, to say, you know, let, let me, let me see if I can shop around my services to other teams. And uh, yeah, We'll decide. Uh, all right, all right. Well, let's uh, let's talk about our MVPs first, and we'll see what we have in the, in the mailbag here, real quickly. You ready to go three, two, one on MVPs? Sure. Yeah, my number number three would be Linderbaum. Uh, had a great game. The one highlight, uh, major highlight, I guess, on the offensive line, and uh, good seeing him have these second good games after his uh, injury. Yeah, he's also my number three guy, and and uh, I I could have could have had Moses in here, but Linderbaum, the higher graded uh, graded player, Moses, I thought had some help in this game, but did a good job. Still, a game you have a holding flag, you're probably not going to be in the MVP rankings. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Andrews would be my next one. He, uh, I guess, we just recently talked about had a gritty performance, got some key catches, good yak, and uh, just a, a standard performance from him. Nothing 
out of the ordinary, but still a solid one. Again, the difference between he's my number two guy as well, by the way, and and the difference between him and Flowers, uh, very similar in terms of receptions, but he's he's getting more out of those individual plays and and making himself a good yards per target player by the combination of Yak and A dot, uh, or, or I guess it's it's good the catch yards as well, and also playing a little bit of defense to make sure interceptions don't happen uh, on the balls thrown to him. That that trust uh, still exists. So he's my number two guy as well. And our number one potentially is Flowers. <laughs> you had Flowers. I have Flowers. Yeah. Oh, I had Lamar. Okay. So what's All your right. what's your there we go. Your, There's Delta. Yeah. Uh, you know, getting that uh first olive out of the jar, as uh Harbaugh put it, is excellent for him. Um, I thought he had a good game, like we talked about earlier. I think in episode one, going back for the ball and uh, you know, being able to improvise off that drag route and get the touchdown was a pretty big trust gainer, and uh, you know, he's just. Playing well, definitely wide receiver one. The snaps show it. The targets show it. Everything shows it. So he's really uh, excelled in his first year so far. Yeah. Exciting part of the offense, certainly. Don't don't uh, blame me for the pick at all. I just thought Lamar did more, uh, particularly in terms of running the ball in this game. Uh, that was a, a, obviously another major contribution. Completed 70% of his passes. The one interception that, that got away from him, obviously, would have made a huge difference in his passer rating to not have that. Um, it would have been well over 100 um, had, uh, had Bateman been able to make a play on the ball. Unfortunate situation and kind of a unlucky situation that the defensive back was behind him, you know, had the sideline as opposed to the, to, the, to the inside of the field to make that play. Normally, even on a back shoulder, that's going to be pretty hard, a pretty hard play for the defensive back to get to that football. So uh, interesting, and and uh, you know maybe even the defensive back took a little risk, figuring that Bateman was out of the play there uh, to make it. So a little bit unfortunate, but anyway, I thought Lamar had a had a another fine game, and uh, I just wish they can find him a little more time to throw. Agreed. Well, looking at the mailbag, we have a couple good uh, questions. I'll, I'll lead it off with uh, Swedish Lemur here. He says, "Do you think the mesh point deception between Lamar and Hill?" was the best we have seen since Ingram. And is it another reason we should temper our expectations that Mitchell may replace Hill eventually as our shifty slash speedy back? That's a, that's a great question. I it, for, Let me start with, I don't think it has to be one or the other because yeah. I love the <laughs> idea of getting Mitchell on as a pony back, but it might be that Mitchell is a guy you put on more often with Edwards. Cause I think that gives you even more, deception about where you're going with your with your gadgetry and you put him also on the field with flowers at the same time but uh uh getting to his his major point about the mesh point why don't you address that part well it's a good observation that hill's been doing well there um and we always know the mesh point is something that takes time to develop i think the biggest thing holding mitchell back is his pass blocking that's my guess of why he's not getting more um run I thought he had some good demonstration of it during the preseason, but you know, obviously this is different. <laughs> you know, regular season is different, the different quality of player. And in, in our history, man, if you look at Harbaugh, JK Dobbins didn't get much opportunity as a rookie. We were being down the door and he was a second round pick, not a, uh, you know, undrafted guy. So definitely has to probably prove himself maybe more than necessary in order to get some snaps. Yeah, it's a trust thing. I would agree, and and being good at the mesh point is something he's going to have to prove. I think the, the Ravens had a set of geriatric backs come through here that it didn't matter how good they were in the mesh point; they just weren't they weren't quick enough to really <laughs> present enough. a credible threat. You know, with Le'Veon Bell and and Freeman and Latavius Murray and all those other names that we ca- don't care to re- repeat for you know over these last two years when when Dobbins and Edwards have have missed time. But uh, yeah, it's it's a um. I, they they have to find out what they have with Mitchell because they have to know what they have to do in 24. Um, and they, they, they do, you know, honestly, it's, it's a, it's a sad situation, but I do think that the Dobbins injury is going to give them an opportunity to sign Dobbins for another year uh, at not too much money. And, and they figured out then again, Dobbins may just want a different situation and he may go to another team and be the number two or number one back on another team and, and, you know, see how it goes. But uh, uh it, it it really is unfortunate. JK's career just has un- unfolded very unfortunately for him and for the Ravens here. Um, and it's just a, just a damn shame that we, we didn't get to appreciate this guy's career the way we'd hoped to. Yeah. Very heartbreaking. Hopefully the story's not completely over. I'm optimistic. I, I actually 
really love the idea of bringing him back next year on a, a private deal. I think it's going to be, I think it's a, it will be a smart way to spend them, their uh, dollars if they're going to spend money on a, a running back. Mm-hmm. So the next question uh, from Brett Hammonds, uh, always appreciate his input here. Harbaugh say that running is usually more efficient in the red zone. Is there a way to look at the average EPA of run versus pass plays in the red zone over the past few years? Um, it'd be interesting to see if the Ravens and the league as a whole. Okay. First of all, there is a way to do that because the uh, NFL faster database has that. Uh, and generally something you can, you can use our program to do. That's not something I'm, I do, but I know people who do it. Josh Mustyko and, and others who uh, are local are, are people who are, who are good at, at querying that. Um, there's all kinds of people who, who can do it. Uh, another guy is um, Dan Reese who's very good yeah. at, at uh, uh, dealing with that. So uh, it's, it's certainly available out there. What I would expect to see is that average EPA on the run might be higher because your passing plays don't have as much space to work with. Your run plays, of course, don't have as much space to work with either. But what I would say is there's much more variation in your run play results when you get down near the goal line. You either get in or you don't. You get in, you significantly increase your expected points. And you don't, you significantly decrease your expected points. <laughs> and it's a, um, it's, it's to me, it, w- it would be a fairly natural that you would see very big differences near the goal line. It wouldn't be necessarily obvious to me that you'd have higher expected point changes um, on average near the goal line. It could be true. I, I wouldn't say no, but it, but, it, but it might not be. Awesome. Well, that's all I see in the film study mailbag for today. All right. Two good ones. Appreciate the questions, guys. Uh, please uh, uh, feel free to use that. I'll, I'll try and be good about uh, asking for uh, questions and comments earlier. Comments, by the way, fine, too. Happy to air something like that and and, and talk through it. And uh, really interesting uh, a couple of thoughts uh, there from these guys today. Uh, Alec, always a pleasure talking football with you. Where where can folks talk to you online? Sure. You find us at One Winning Pod. Uh, like I mentioned in the first show, we did a really cool uh, Lions preview if you want to check it out with uh, Glover Quinn and uh, adding a little bit more video content to the YouTube channel. So make sure to check it out. All right. Outstanding stuff. I definitely definitely want to listen to what Glover Quinn has to say about coverages in the NFL. He's certainly around the league for a long time. Uh, other folks out there, if you'd like to be on a film study short, hit me up. DMs are always open on Twitter. You know the drill by now. Lots of good suggestions coming in. I want to hear from more on you. That's how I meet new people and 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 find folks to have on the show. And uh, it's that's part of the fun of, of doing what I do. So I, I really do want to hear from you. I promise I'll get back to you quickly. Alec, thanks again for coming on. Thanks so much, Ken. We'll talk to you next time on Film Study.